are designed for a single purpose, to kill with maximum efficiency. From flying shrapnel to rapid fire flying bullets, from irradiation to incineration, to a microscopic drop of a lethal chemical agent. These weapons all have one thing in common. If you're in their crosshairs, there's nowhere to hide. Now, deadliest weapons on Modern Marvels. On a cloudy fall day, a Soviet Tu-95 bomber flies over the island Novaya Zimla, located in the Arctic Sea. Reaching a height of 35,000 feet, the pilot drops his ordnance. The Tsar Bomba, a 50 megaton nuclear bomb. Within moments, the fusion device detonates, shooting a flash of light through the atmosphere, visible from 600 miles away. It was, and remains, the largest nuclear detonation in history. It was originally designed to be 100 megatons. It very nearly killed the senior officer who was piloting the aircraft that dropped the test article. Capable of destroying everything within a 15-mile radius and delivering third-degree burns within a 64-mile radius. The Tsar Bomba remains the final word in total annihilation of an enemy target. Today, the Tsar Bomba is but a reminder of the Cold War arms race and the danger of an all-out nuclear war that would have likely caused the destruction of both the US and Soviet Union, if not the world. Yet the threat of nuclear attack from our former adversary remains. The risk of accidental attack is more serious, I think, than most people uh, realize. The Russians maintain a large nuclear arsenal. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, they've had a huge economic setback. Their warning system has deteriorated terribly. There are gaps in their radars. Their satellites have broken down. The Russians, of course, reassure us that, no, we have nothing to worry about. But the consequences would be so grave that we should take it very, very seriously, even if it has a minuscule chance of happening at all. The threat of a nuclear attack from a rogue nation or a well-organized stateless group is also cause for grave concern. Whether North Korea has nuclear weapons is very much in the press today. But should terrorists get their hands on sufficient nuclear materials, either to make a non-nuclear weapon, a radiological weapon, or to actually get a nuclear detonation, however small, would be a horrendous uh, attack. The evolution of precision guidance systems has eliminated the need for large yield nuclear weapons like the Tsar Bomba. But make no mistake, the detonation of a one megaton nuclear bomb would yield more destructive power than any weapon the world has ever seen. Weapon, thermonuclear warhead. Yield one megaton surface blast. Energy released, blast 50%. Thermal radiation, 40%. Fallout, 10%. To comprehend the true lethality of a thermonuclear explosion requires an understanding of the massive amount of energy that's released upon detonation. When a thermonuclear bomb detonates, an instantaneous fission reaction creates a secondary fusion reaction, fusing hydrogen and its isotopes together to form helium, releasing enormous amounts of energy. And it occurs in a very small volume. Therefore, the total energy divided by the volume is very large. And that means the temperatures are stupendously high. Temperatures that are higher than the center of the sun. Upon detonation, a thermonuclear bomb emits a stream of X-rays, infrared rays, and gamma rays. 
This is referred to as thermal radiation and is visible to the naked eye in the form of a brilliant flash of light lasting from one to 10 seconds. It emits all of this X radiation that's absorbed by the air around it. The outside of the air is burning. It's forming basically smog. The nitrogen and the oxygen are reacting, turns brown, and so the light coming out actually goes down until that burns off, and then it goes up again. The heat from the infrared rays will set people and buildings on fire. The X-rays will irradiate those closest to the explosion. The X-rays don't get very far. They're absorbed by the air. The air is then heated up by these X-rays to millions of degrees. The immense heat expands the air around the point of impact, creating a spherical shock wave and winds that can reach hundreds of miles per hour. And if it were a humid day, you'd be able to see that shock wave running along the ground and through the air because it would cause instant condensation of moisture in the atmosphere and you'd see sort of a white ghost of a shock wave traveling through the air. The wind from the shock wave extinguishes the fires caused by the thermal radiation, but will flatten everything in its path within a radius of two miles. You get the expansion out, but then the thermal plume of the bomb is rising. The mushroom cloud is forming. And so you'll get a counter flow, which when air flows up, it sucks things in. And so you get a reversal of the flow as things flow back toward the detonation center and rise. A one megaton surface explosion will lift tons of soil up into the mushroom cloud, which will become irradiated and return as fallout. The heaviest fallout particles will rain down closest to ground zero. People exposed to this fallout will die in a matter of hours from acute radiation sickness. The smaller particles may travel thousands of miles, depending on wind velocity. If you ingest the material and it stays in your body, the long-term impact is that it can produce significant excess cancer of various sorts. The combination of thermal radiation, shockwave, and fallout could potentially kill millions, making the thermonuclear bomb easily the world's deadliest weapon. By 2004, the nuclear fraternity consisted of seven countries that had all detonated nuclear devices. Other countries were desperately working toward joining the family. Thus, there appears to be no end in sight to nuclear proliferation, and no end to the threat of attack from the world's deadliest weapon. According to the Center for Defense Information, there are approximately 30,000 intact nuclear warheads worldwide. All but 200 are retained by the United States and Russia. It's one of the deadliest chemical agents ever created. Within seconds of exposure, Symptoms of nausea and convulsions take over. Without emergency treatment, paralysis, respiratory failure, and death can occur within minutes. This deadly killer is the nerve agent VX. Weapon VX. Classification organophosphate. Lethal dose 30 micrograms. The organophosphate type of chemicals are considered nerve agents because they attack the nervous system. The nervous system controls all of the functions of the body, and so by interrupting or stimulating that, you get all these various effects. VX in its normal state is a tasteless, odorless liquid that can be absorbed through the skin in seconds. When heated, it turns into a lingering vapor that if inhaled is even more deadly. VX is a persistent agent, which means it's less volatile than the other nerve agents. This means that uh, when it's exposed to the air, uh, the material doesn't go up into the air, and it lasts much longer. To give you an idea of how toxic the chemical is, if you pulled a penny out of your pocket, and if you looked at the penny and you looked at Lincoln's eye, it only takes a drop the size of Lincoln's eye to cause lethality. 
there are no confirmed cases of VX being used on people. But it's widely believed that during Saddam Hussein's chemical attack against the Kurds in 1988, VX was dispersed with deadly results. The attack on the Kurds killed over 5,000. VX is the most potent nerve agent today, but the path to its discovery dates back to before World War I. Chemists knew that many of the chemicals used in the dye industry and other uh, industries could be very deadly. During World War I, the Germans began to weaponize chemicals by putting in artillery shells and portable chemical cylinders and releasing them on the battlefield. And they used them very effectively. Although chemical agents were effective in causing casualties, they were not always lethal. But that would change in the 1930s, when German scientists created the first nerve agent named Tabun. Between 1942 and 1945, they produced 12,000 tons of Tabun, as well as several thousand variations, including sarin. The nerve agents were definitely unique compared to the earlier World War I chemical warfare agents. They had very little smell to them. They began affecting the person very quickly and were much more lethal. When Germany fell to the Allies in 1945, its chemical stockpile was seized, and the United States began producing its own variation of the German nerve agents, which became classified as G agents. The most widely produced was a far more lethal version of sarin nerve gas. But by the early 1950s, an even deadlier nerve agent was discovered. A British company was investigating some insecticides and came across a particularly potent one. They looked at it and then referred it to the United States in about 1953-54 time frame. And the United States looked at it and realized that it was a whole new series of very potent nerve agents that had been discovered. They looked at all of them and then decided that probably VX was the one that they would like to go with. From 1961 to 1968, the United States produced approximately 4,400 tons of VX, enough to kill every human being on the planet. The U.S. stockpile served as a deterrent against the Soviet Union, which had begun producing even larger supplies of chemical agents, including the nerve agents Soman, Sarin, and VX. In 1960 and 61, we standardized a uh, artillery projectile and we came up with a newly designed landmine and also loaded VX in a rocket warhead. Fortunately, neither country ever used the lethal nerve agent against the other. In 1969, Richard Nixon agreed to ban the U.S. manufacturing of chemical weapons. Production of VX ceased, and the stockpile was placed in storage. Today, only the United States and Russia claim to have stockpiles of VX. Yet some suspect that Iraq may have produced large quantities of the deadly nerve agent. At the onset of Operation Iraqi Freedom, U.S. forces prepared for the worst. We felt that it was very likely that uh, our adversaries would use chemical weapons against us, and we felt that they had VX in their arsenal. VX is often used as a terrain denial weapon, kind of the way you would use landmines. And one of the things we're very concerned about is not having our forces stumble into land that's been contaminated with VX. The main goal at Edgewood Chemical and Biological Center in Maryland is to provide protection and detection for the U.S. troops in Iraq. We have the best protected force in the world. And each warfighter has all the protective equipment that he or she needs, the protective clothing and, and the protective mask. The masks will totally protect you against uh, inhaling VX. And the chemical protective clothing is specially designed so that the VX can't penetrate it. In January of 2005, the United States ended its hunt for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. 
no VX was found. But the threat of VX doesn't end in Iraq. Other countries are suspected to be attempting to produce the deadly agent. And there is enough VX in the US and Russian stockpiles to kill millions. So the threat of attack from one of the world's deadliest weapons remains. The most effective antidote to VX is a mixture of drugs that includes atropine, proladoxine chloride, and diazepam. Auto-injector kits containing these drugs are given to U.S. soldiers in case of a VX attack. The machine gun. It's not just a weapon, it's a cultural icon. For some, it's even a nickname. But in its essence, it's a lethal killing machine. With the ability to fire hundreds of rounds of ammunition in seconds, the machine gun has remained a constant on the battlefield since the Civil War. But of all the wars in which it's been used, it's the Maxim machine gun of World War I that brought the weapon to the apex of its lethality. Weapon, Maxim Heavy Machine Gun. Rate of fire, 500 rounds per minute. Range, 4,000 yards. The first functional rapid fire weapon was the Gatling gun. Invented by physician Richard Jordan Gatling in 1862. But the rapid fire killing potential of Gatling's weapon was limited by its rather impractical design. The Gatling gun was heavy. It was uh, prone to malfunction with the cranking, the cartridges getting stuck. It wasn't exactly the kind of handy thing that you move across the battlefield at a good clip. And in fact, all the early Gatling guns were horse-drawn, so that certainly limited their mobility. The Gatling gun was largely abandoned by 1883, when another American, Hiram Maxim, invented the first completely automatic weapon. He was a man with a very fertile mind, uh, and in 1881, he went to London. Uh, while there, one of his uh, friends reportedly said to him, uh, Hiram, why don't you develop a new way for Europeans to kill each other? They're always at each other's throats. You can make a lot of money. And he kind of said, oh, OK, <laughs> I'll invent some guns. And within a couple of years, I mean, it took that little time, he had invented the machine gun. The automatic firing system of the Maxim machine gun consisted of an action, a reaction, and an action. When a round fired, it produced a recoil force that loaded the next round in place while simultaneously ejecting the spent cartridge. Maxim licensed his design to the British company Vickers, which quickly produced the Vickers Maxim machine gun. Allowed to keep the rights to his invention, Maxim proceeded to license his weapon to Russia and Germany. Germany immediately saw the potential for a rapid fire weapon, and by 1908, they were mass producing the Maxim machine gun under the name Maschinengewehr, or MG08. Unbeknownst to Maxim, he had sold his rapid fire killing machine to countries that would soon be enemies in the First World War. This is the Maxim machine gun. This is the German model 1908. And this was the standard machine gun of the German army in World War I. And this large thing that people at first thought it was the actual barrel, but this is actually a water jacket that goes around the barrel. The barrel gets so hot during the firing, the water cools it and keeps it from warping. And the ammunition uh, would come in belts of 250 cartridges. It would be steered into the feed here, and then cock it like this, pull the belt in another time, cock it again. Now you're ready to go. There's both thumbs on the trigger, and you're firing. And if all the conditions are right, you can fire 500 rounds in a minute. World War I created an arena in which the Vickers and MG-08 were pitted against one another. And 
And although they were identical in design, the numbers available at the onset of the war were completely lopsided. The most organized and disciplined and clear thinking force uh, in the European theater were the Germans. And they had seen the importance of the machine gun. They already had 12,500 Maxims, and it took the British forever to get them organized and flowing at the rate that the Germans had organized them and produced them. In September 1914, the German offensive into France was stopped at the Battle of the Marne. The Germans, now in a defensive mode, demonstrated the tactical importance of the Maxim machine gun. The homelands uh, to their rear and dug in, the machine gun proves to be the ideal weapon against enemy attackers. The role of the machine gun was to lay down tremendous direct firepower that until you could learn how to outflank it and to beat it by maneuver, drove everybody into trenches and stagnated the war. A machine gun could wipe out an entire group of men very quickly, thousands and thousands of men in a very short time. Although field commanders knew the dangers of facing machine gun fire in the heavily barbed wired no man's land, it did little to change their steadfast tactics. The mentality of stand up and face your enemy and fight was still in the minds of commanders during World War I. It was madness to think that the infantry were still the prime way of, of carrying a position uh, simply by walking into the face of machine guns, which is exactly the tactics that the British espoused. In no other battle of the war did the Maxim machine gun spill more blood than at the Battle of the Somme in July of 1916. The British commander, Sir Douglas Haig, calculated that by bombarding the German positions with enough artillery fire, uh, he could cut the German defensive wire force the Germans underground, and that the British infantry then could charge through the cuts in the wire and get through the German lines before the dazed survivors could pop up from their shelters underground. Sir Douglas Haig was wrong. Uh, the uh, bombardment did not uh, cut enough of the wire. Uh, the Germans had prepared in advance uh, positions 50 feet or more underground uh, so that they could survive this terrific bombardment. After eight days of constant shelling, British commander Douglas Haig sent his troops out of their trenches to attack the German front. The cue to the Germans was the break when the artillery barrage stopped. Uh, they'd been in this war for almost two years already. They knew what was coming. It was not a hard thing for the Germans to figure out. Armed and ready, German machine gunners mowed down the attacking British infantry, killing thousands in just the first minutes. At day's end, 57,000 British soldiers were either wounded or killed. dark one-day record in British warfare that still stands today. For the next four months, the Battle of the Somme raged. Eventually, the Allies declared victory. But the carnage left behind amounted to nearly one million British, French, and German soldiers dead many falling to their deaths under a hail of bullets from one of the deadliest weapons ever created, the Maxim machine gun. Because Hiram Maxim patented his machine gun in Britain, Germany was forced to pay a fee to the British government for every Maxim machine gun it produced. Since the dawn of organized warfare, fire has been employed on the battlefield with deadly results. But in World War II, fire in the form of incendiary bombs reached a new level of lethality by literally transforming cities into hell on earth.
General Sherman gave us the aphorism, war is hell. But it wasn't until decades after his death that war reached levels of hell that he could not begin to fathom. In the Second World War, Air Force commanders had a wide range of specialized bombs at their disposal. However, if the strategic goal was to destroy an entire city, the preferred bomb was the incendiary. An incendiary bomb typically is composed of a lot of very small devices weighing only a few pounds. They're designed to start a fire, and more importantly, to start a fire that turns into a much bigger fire. Weapon, incendiary bomb, primary incendiary fuels, thermite, magnesium, napalm, and phosphorus. The World War II incendiary bomb resembled a long stick filled with fuel, which was weighted down at one end to provide somewhat accurate delivery. The bomb was either dropped as a single projectile or packed inside a casing, which would break apart before impact, dispersing hundreds of incendiary sticks in a cluster. Upon impact, a heat-producing chemical activated the incendiary fuel. One large bomber could carry over 3,000 four-pound incendiary sticks, capable of starting thousands of fires. Under ideal conditions, these fires would join together and create a firestorm. In the early months of 1945, Nazi Germany was on the verge of collapse. Russian troops coming from the east, coupled with their allies coming from the west, planned to squeeze Germany into submission. However, the Germans have just launched the Ardennes Offensive, which shocked the socks off of all the Allied leaders. It was that shock which uh, prompted uh, the change in the bombing campaigns, particularly the one that led to Dresden. Britain had two strategic goals in attacking the city of Dresden, Germany. One was to aid the Russian invasion by disarming the city's communications. The second was to destroy German morale by killing large numbers of civilians. The British shifted fundamentally to a policy of what they called area or morale bombing. As one British uh, writer put it, the campaign of uh, morale bombing was really a cosmetic term for massacre. Winston Churchill's command to use incendiaries against Germany was carried out with great success by Royal Air Force Commander Arthur Bomber Harris. Harris was the true believer. Harris felt that uh, attacking German cities would not just inconvenience the Germans, it would bring them down. On the night of February 13, 1945, 250 British Lancasters flying at low altitude attacked Dresden with the intent of creating a firestorm. The British really perfected the recipe for incendiary attack. They would first send in a small group of planes as pathfinders to mark the aiming point. Behind those planes came the main force, which were aircraft loaded with high explosive bombs, which were designed to blow the roofs off of buildings and otherwise shatter the structure to make them uh, kindling for the large bundles of incendiaries that followed. And this worked to perfection in creating large fires. During the first raid, which lasted 15 minutes, over 300 tons of thermite incendiaries were dropped on Dresden. Minutes after the bombardment stopped, thousands of fires came together to form a massive firestorm. That fire thrusts up a fountain column of incandescent gases and burning uh, debris which spread the fire. But more importantly, it acts like a bellows. It sucks in air and oxygen into the fire at winds of gale force, which frequently will suck individuals back into the fire. Temperatures inside the core of the firestorm reached upwards of 1,500 degrees Celsius. You had the most horrific scenes of, you know, thousands of women, babies trapped in these infernos with these superheated 100 mile an hour winds burning them up. Ten square miles of Dresden were completely destroyed. The number of people killed is unknown, but estimates range from 25,000 to 40,000. 
As horrific as the burning of Dresden was, it was only a taste of what was to come. Less than a month later, the United States began firebombing Japanese cities, utilizing a new incendiary fuel called napalm. The Army Air Force realized early in the war that their two incendiary bombs relied upon either rubber or magnesium, both of which were in terribly short supply. They came up with a compound of uh, naphthenic and palminic acids, which were contracted to co be called napalm, which was mixed with gasoline and produced by far the most effective incendiary device of World War II. Napalm burns with extreme intensity, and its stringy and sticky consistency allows it to spread more effectively than other incendiaries. By March of 1945, Curtis LeMay, in charge of the 21st Bomber Command, concluded that high-altitude daytime bombing was simply not accurate enough to be effective against Japanese targets. Curtis LeMay directed his crewmen to fly not in the daytime, but at night. Much of Japanese industry was uh, cottage industry scattered out in the cities, and so LeMay aimed at the cities themselves. Burn the cities down, and you would destroy Japanese war industry, and at the same time, uh, you might so horrify the Japanese leadership that it would give up. On March 9th, 330 B-29 bombers took off from the Mariana Islands, headed for Tokyo, Japan. After two hours of the bombardment, the wooden city of Tokyo was engulfed in a firestorm. These fires were so hot that they would literally ignite the clothing of individuals as they were fleeing. What was particularly horrifying was a lot of the women wore what they called air raid turbans around their heads, and the heat would ignite those turbans like igniting the wick on a candle to start uh, consuming them with flame. The aftermath of the incendiary bombings on the evenings of March 9th and 10th led to an estimated 100,000 Japanese killed. The night raid against Tokyo was the most devastating single raid ever carried out by aircraft in any war to include the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Once the success of that campaign became clear, the Army Air Force then simply got out of the list of the 180 largest Japanese cities and began firebombing every single city on that list uh, to produce an end to the war. At the end of the firebombing campaign, 64 Japanese cities and nearly 200 square miles were burned to the ground. The final death toll was estimated at 200,000. Technological advancements in precision-guided missiles eventually put an end to incendiary carpet bombing. But the legacy of the Allied firebombing campaigns against Germany and Japan, and the tremendous loss of life associated with them, firmly established the incendiary bomb as one of the deadliest weapons ever used in battle. In 1980, a United Nations convention banned the use of napalm and other incendiaries against civilian populations. The United States refused to ratify the treaty and continues to use incendiaries. In World War II, the United States and Japan engaged in a series of carrier battles that would play a crucial role in deciding the battle for the Pacific. With the outcome in doubt, the U.S. Navy unleashed a secret weapon called the VT Fuse, which devastated Japanese aircraft with unmatched lethality. If you were making a list of the most important technological breakthroughs that came out of World War II, just below the atomic bomb and radar in general, you would list the VT Fuse, which absolutely transformed the effectiveness of anti-aircraft fire. Before the U.S. became involved in the Second World War, the Navy realized that a revolutionary advance in anti-aircraft fuses would be necessary to combat the growing effectiveness of the airplane. To shoot down an airplane required an average of 2,400 rounds of ammunition early in the war. Hitting an aircraft moving at high speed in three dimensions with a gun on a ship 
is one of the most difficult feats in warfare. There's simply too many variables to be accurately predicted. The difficulty in shooting down enemy aircraft was largely due to the inadequacies associated with anti-aircraft fuses. A fuse is either a mechanical or electronic detonating device designed to set off the bursting charge of a projectile, bomb, or torpedo. Although all fuses serve the same function, the triggering mechanism varies. Two different types of fuses were available to uh, the major navies. Uh, one type of fuse was the contact fuse. Uh, that is, the uh, projectile actually had to hit the aircraft for the fuse to detonate the projectile. Uh, the chances of hitting an aircraft were slender. A better fuse was a fuse activated by time. The gunners would set the fuse as the projectile was loaded into the gun. The fuse would detonate uh, after a predetermined time. If your guesstimate is off by uh, even a couple of seconds, the projectile will be hopelessly out of range of the aircraft. The remedy was to create a fuse that used a high frequency signal to detonate within proximity of the target. Weapon, proximity fuse, detonation method, remote sensing of target. The task of finding a high frequency mechanism small enough to fit on an artillery shell and durable enough to withstand the 20,000 G-force associated with being shot out of a gun were believed to be too difficult to overcome. But at the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University, physicist Merle Tuve and a group of scientists, engineers, and ham radio experts embraced the challenge. Merle was a genius. He was a rough, tough, slightly profane individual. I hated the man, but hate and love are very close. Early in the program, Tuve determined that using radio frequencies would be the most practical way to create an effective proximity fuse. A radio proximity fuse works by emitting radio frequencies from an oscillator, which bounce off the reflective surface of an object, such as an enemy aircraft. The reflected pulse then returns amplified, triggering the fuse detonator and exploding the projectile. If detonation occurs close enough to the target, fragments from the exploding shell will destroy it. The problems that were faced in the development of a proximity fuse were first to choose the mechanism, the type of fuse. We do not have transistors and therefore were dependent upon vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes were not intended for this class of environment. However, early experimentation found that there was at least the potential for making the commercial sub-miniature vacuum tubes uh, withstand that environment. In 1941, miniature commercial vacuum tubes engineered by Sylvania and others were sent to the Applied Physics Laboratory. There, they were incorporated into the first test fuses, named the Mark 32 VT fuse. Every day we would build perhaps 30 fuse units that would be driven to a test field and fired the following day. Meanwhile, we would be building another group of fuses according to a new prescription. Under a veil of secrecy, the Applied Physics Laboratory worked on perfecting the radio proximity fuse for the next 18 months. In January 1942, the VT fuse reached a success rate of 50% when within proximity of its target. Deemed more effective than the saturation shelling needed for contact and time fuses, the U.S. Ordnance Committee fully endorsed the VT fuse project. Mass production began immediately. We didn't work eight-hour days. We worked whatever the job called for. On one occasion, I worked for 48 hours straight. And everybody else desperately wanted to contribute 
toward the winning of that war. The pressures were huge. In January of 1943, a naval anti-aircraft gun equipped with the first batch of proximity-fused projectiles shot down an attacking Japanese plane. One target, one kill. The proximity fuse had arrived. Earlier, it took 2,400 shells to bring down an aircraft. The number now was 400. So you have a six-fold increase in uh, anti-aircraft effectiveness with this fuse. Proximity fuses were quickly sent to the naval fleet in the Pacific. In the battle for the Philippine Sea, the fuse decimated Japanese aircraft. Every one of the American ships was loaded with radio proximity fuses. They shot down Japanese planes by the hundreds. 395 planes were lost by the Japanese, which was 92% of the planes they brought to the event. The battle was the culminating battle of the Pacific. But concerns about America's secret weapon falling into enemy hands led the Navy to disallow its use over land until December of 1944. At the Battle of the Bulge, VT-fused artillery shells laid waste to the Germans. The first time it was used, it stopped a German push about 50 miles into the Bulge, and about 400 Germans were killed. Projectiles would come in and they would burst at a relatively uniform height in synchronization, and you would have this immense barrage of exploding shells just above the ground, spraying the hail of shrapnel that was deadly. The lethal impact of America's secret weapon was perhaps summed up best by a letter from General George S. Patton, who wrote, the new shell with the funny fuse is devastating. I think that when all armies get this shell, we will have to devise some new method of warfare. Patton's formal testimony officially solidified the VT fuse as one of World War II's deadliest weapons. The violent century that gave rise to the deadliest weapons the world has ever seen has also left behind a surplus of lesser weapons available on the black market that may prove to be just as deadly. Small arms and light weapons take the lives of hundreds of thousands of people each year in ordinary crime and also in conflict zones. They perpetuate conflict. There's 630 million of these weapons in circulation today. Now that's in government stockpiles as well as on the black market. In 1993, Somalian insurgents demonstrated what a well-funded and well-armed militia is capable of achieving. Somali militiamen using only small arms and light weapons forced the United States and its billion dollars worth of sophisticated military technology from Somalia. The decisive weapon, the rocket-propelled grenade, 40-year-old Soviet military technology that can be acquired on the black market often for less than $1,000. The proliferation of the small arms black market has paved the way for well-funded terrorist groups and rogue nations to kill indiscriminately and without consequence. But what will the consequences be if they get access to the world's deadliest weapon? If uranium enrichment becomes very easy, lots of countries can build nuclear weapons. And what will the world look like when anybody can kill everybody? The result may be an even deadlier world, where nuclear weapons may no longer deter, and all it takes to kill hundreds of thousands is a cause and currency.